So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ileana Soto Welty, and I'm the executive director of MEPA, the multi ethnic collaborative of community agencies. And we work to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities and address health equity. Um, welcome to our ACEs Aware provider conversation. Before we get started with our featured speaker today, we always start with a quick overview of what, of what our ACEs Adverse Childhood Experiences and the ACEs Aware Initiative. We are really happy to be selected as the ACEs Aware grantee in partnership with Early Childhood OC that is providing these uh, workshops. Um, the ACEs Aware Initiative was launched by the Office of the California Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, and the California Department of Healthcare Services, which is leading a first in the nation statewide effort to screen children and adults for adverse childhood experiences in primary care and to treat the impacts of toxic stress with trauma informed care. The ACEs Aware Initiative is built on the consensus of scientific evidence demonstrating that early detection and evidence based intervention improve health outcomes and mitigate the health impacts of toxic stress. For more information, you can go to acesaware.org. Also recently, OC was awarded an ACES Network of Care grant led by MindOC. Um, Mecca is participating um, in leading the Equity and Inclusion Committee for this network. And um, part of this, these conversations will also help inform a brown paper that we're putting together on the racial and ethnic implications and perspectives in the screening and treatment screening and treatment of um, ACEs. At Mecca, we have begun incorporating ACEs into our work to ensure that our ethnic communities um, are aware of resilient strategies and what ACEs are. Today's conversation is targeted to providers, but really this is something we all need to become more aware of. So we are really happy that you are all here. Um, we're also on Facebook Live. Um, I will put more in-depth information in the chat, um, as well as other links, um, and also have a couple of polls and a survey for all you to fill out. Um, but let me introduce to you who we have today. Um, we have Dr. Miriam Sayeti, um, who is a psychologist. She is also the executive director of OMID Multicultural Institute for, for Development, and Dr. Miguel Gallardo and myself will be moderating. Dr. Gallardo is the uh, research and um, evaluation director at Mecca. He's also a professor of psychology at Pepperdine University. And our topic today is cultivating a culturally trauma-informed approach. So what are ACEs? Um, in this chart, you'll see um, the ACEs uh, that are typically screened. Um, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse, um, physical and emotional neglect, um, mental illness, um, domestic violence, divorce, substance use, and having an incarcerated uh, parent or relative. The initial research uh, study conducted by Kaiser in the San Diego Centers for Disease Control um, there were about 17,000 people that uh, participated in that study, and two out of three reported at least one adverse childhood experience. More than one in five reported three or more ACEs. One in eight reported four or more ACEs. The higher prevalence of ACEs um, that occurred for people are, um, were mostly from low income, people of color, and those involved in the justice system, as well as L the LGBTQ community which puts them more at risk. This slide shows how the social and economic inequities are expressed in our health, well-being, and susceptibility to disease. ACEs dramatically increases risk for nine out of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States. Eliana, can you, uh, they're asking to put it in presentation notes, they can see the PowerPoint. They're not able to see it? Well, it's, I think it's small. I think it's too small. So yeah, just FY, a couple put that, uh, put people put that in the chat, so. Okay. Um, well, I don't, I can't do that right now, but um, I will be able to provide this PowerPoint to folks afterwards. So we can email it out. There's only about three slides. Um, so the, the leading causes of death, um, 
impacted by ACEs include heart disease, cancer, chronic, lower respiratory disease, strokes, Alzheimer's, a diabetes, kidney disease, and um, also suicide attempts. As the number of ACEs increases, especially those with four or more ACEs, so does the risk for these leading causes of death. Um, what the ACEs study has taught us is that um, childhood adversity is the leading cause of health and social problems in our nation. The social determinants of health, um, which are the economic, educational, and social conditions that also include our community and environmental factors, such as where we live, work, and play, as well as as well as our access to services and supports ultimately are forces that expose or protect us from toxic stress. Through the network of care, we hope to build out what we plan to address um, and plan to address this by developing buffering resources to address um, these um, social determinants of health and toxic stress. To get us started on our conversation, I'll pass it over to Dr. Gallardo and to also introduce uh, Dr. Sietti. All right, great. Um, well, uh, I don't, I don't uh, have a whole lot to say. I really want to give Dr. Sayedi the time to do what she's got to do. So I'll quickly just give her a, a brief introduction just so folks um, have some context for who she is in case um, you're not local. I know that we, we've gotten national representation on these webinars before. And so just in case, um, Dr. Sayedi is the founder and executive director of OMID, Multicultural Institute for Development. Um, She's also an adjunct faculty in the Department of Counseling at Cal State University, Fullerton. Uh, she obtained her doctorate degree from Washington State University in clinical psychology with an emphasis on child development and neuropsychology. She's been working more than 20 years uh, in the clinical realm, um, doing a lot of administration, direct services, teaching uh, with diverse populations, um, with primarily children and their families. Um, she's authored chapters and presented on if issues uh, related to providing culturally responsive mental health care to Iranian American and Middle Eastern immigrants uh, communities here in the United States. So um, having said all that, welcome Dr. Sayedi. It's nice to, nice to be with you and share some time with you. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel and Ileana. Thank you for actually having me today and inviting me and thank you uh, audience showing up. I know you have probably better things to do on a Friday, but thank you for being here. Um, I'll try to make this as painless as possible. <laughs> and so I actually decided to um, take on a different approach for this talk to make it more personal, to make it more palpable, um, and um, also invite the audience from time to time to kind of reflect on their own experiences as they are engaging with us. Um, there was a time that a uh, conversation about trauma um, or even talking about culturally responsive work with trauma were just really not heard of. When I went through grad school and got training, we did not talk about any of this. Mm -hmm. um, only clinicians dealt with trauma as a PTSD, post-traumatic stress. The concept of little t trauma was not really in existence. Um, and ACEs were nowhere to be found. Uh -huh. And therefore the field was very, very limited. So, and we were all dealing with issues with clients, with trauma and what have you uh, from a very clinical medical perspective. Yeah. So I think one of the things about ACE that an ACE awareness and all the movement around this issue is notable. And I would like to kind of talk about that uh, later in this talk. First, I'm going to start with something more personal. But what is really notable is that it has brought this experience into our daily experiences. It brought it into um, different organizations. And we are talking about trauma-informed policies and procedures. And so it really warms my heart, to be honest with you, as, a, as an older psychologist who've gone through a, a medical model training, to hear that um, we are beginning to actually understand um, hum humanity and understand the complexity of uh, our experiences. And um, in a way, we're not minimizing or um, just focusing on categorizing things in, in a very small way. We are open to taking perspectives. We are open to considering other ways of looking at things. 
other ways of um, dealing with things. And that is really the whole concept of being culturally responsive is to be able to step outside of what our comfort zone is as clinicians <laughs> to label and diagnose and uh, start with a pill somewhere and just open up conversations, um, be curious, be mindful and be kind and be sort of um, also uh, present with our own experiences because we are part of this process. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's why I actually wanted just to make sure that I put some humanity, which is my own experience into today's talk. So please feel free to interrupt me at any point that you feel like you want to highlight something or you want me to extend on another subject or what have you, um, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, okay I'm right. pretty open to that. Yeah, no, no, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. Sure. Um, um, so my life actually <laughs> is, um, if once I go through some of it, you will understand as to why um, providing service and working with the underserved community is truly a passion for me. And those of you who have a psychoanalytic orientation probably find another reason for it. <laughs> but um, I, I wanted just to uh, help you sort of see how these early childhood experiences, small t, big t, however you want to label it, how they are impacting people over time. And some of us, our entire uh, life um, goal or way of living and um, experiences may be 100% influenced by how we experience life early on. So they are important. They are very important. They kind of almost, I don't want to use deterministic, positivistic kind of language, but almost they determine who we are. Mm -hmm. um, and we are extremely relational. So those relational early experiences, when they're traumatic, they certainly have a significant impact on how we are wired neurologically, how we respond to life in a way, and also who we become. Mm. So without uh, further uh, sort of avoidance to get to talk about my life, I was born uh, and raised in Iran, in Mashhad. Mashhad is a city, is a capital city of um, Northern Eastern province of Khorasan. And the reason I'm highlighting this is to help you understand that geographically speaking, um, I was born in an area in Iran that is Northeastern bordering Russia and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And my grandma actually has had some uh, ancestry, kind of Russian ancestry. So I was born into sort of a multicultural setting to begin with. Um, okay. I'm trying to, I, I get things popped up in my screen that kind of actually kind of uh, makes me uh, lose my focus. But the whole point is that I was uh, born and raised in an area that we, and we saw Afghans a lot. As a child, we would see Afghans selling things or you will see people who are from an Afghan origin in the streets, in the city, in the places. And <clears throat> what is interesting is that we were told as children to stay away from Afghans because they will kidnap you and they will cut your head off. I mean, we were really scared of diversity. We were, we were told not to get close to people, but thank God for my own um, oppositional defiant streak that I have. I never really listened to anybody. So, and I kind of basically noticed that whatever people have told me are not true, but just so that you understand, I was raised in that environment with a lot of discrimination and judgment against Afghans. And then later you will see, I have opened up an organization to support and help Afghans. So um, interesting enough, after that kind of a, uh, experience that was very, very prominent because we, we would go out trying to play out in the streets and we were constantly warned. This, this was happening on a daily basis, practically. Um, I was also raised in a household that, uh, with people of different backgrounds, um, coming from different regions of Iran. And Iran actually is a very, uh, contrary to perhaps the general belief, is a very heterogeneous um, country 
There are five different ethnicities, uh, different languages, different religions. So it's a very diverse country. It's not uh, all homogeneously speaking Farsi and coming from the same ethnic background. So in our household, we have people who were working in the household who were coming from different places in uh, Iran. So growing up, I actually heard three different languages uh, speaking around me. I, I heard Turkish, I heard Farsi, I heard Baluchi, and these are all different languages and dialects. Um, and I also noticed acutely um, and became aware of the socioeconomic disparities. Um, my family lived in a very big house and I had nanny and I had, uh, and we had cooks, we had people who cleaned the house, gardener, gardeners. So there were a lot of people coming and going. But all of these people who were serving in the house lived in that house. They just lived in a different place. They lived across the yard. It was a big yard, but they lived across it. So they were in home um, support people that kind of helped us um, run the daily life. I, I'm trying to avoid using the word, the word servant because I just have reaction to it, to be honest with you. But that was what was going on. So, and I was the only child. So I was the only child of this family. Uh, and then here are many other people working around me and they all had children too. And the children's on the other hand were on the other side of the yard. So for me as an only child who really loved to play with the other kids, the only kids who were around, um, I had to sort of find opportunity to escape from this side of the yard to the other side of the yard to play. Um, and this was actually actually a major issue growing up for my mom as she believed I am learning bad habits and poor language skills by playing with the children across the yard. She also liked me to dress up, wear nice shiny shoes, pretty dresses, etc. So being a sensitive kid, um, that was really, really hard for me. Um, I was really acutely aware of the status gap um, so I devised my own way to manage this disparity. I made sure that I ruin every brand new shoe that my mom bought me um, by rubbing the sides and the front of the shoe on that yard concrete surface. So they were all basically ruined within a day. I also stained and messed up my nice dresses. And when my mom was looking, I actually changed um, into something old and crappy um, so that when I'm out there playing with the kids, they did not feel bad or be embarrassed, not having the shiny shoes or nice clothes. So this is growing up. And I was with this environment for a long time till we actually moved to the capital of Iran, to Tehran. But I was raised with these kids, constantly being aware that there is a big gap, there is a big disparity here. And did my darnest to get them as much as I could. Um, whatever they want to get for me, I would say, oh, Sanso would really like this too, and things like that. And as you notice now, I am running a nonprofit organization trying to help the underserved community. So in a sense, that became a passion for me um, to sort of make sure that I am supporting and helping. And class differences is one of the, um, one of my sort of issues in life to kind of um, help people who are really dealing with those financial insecurities. Um, it's very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. And so that experience early in life really um, pushed me in a, in a very interesting direction. How I became a psychologist had to do with my mom. And that is yet another presentation. So if we have time, I can speak about what happened in that direction that kind of caused me to become a psychologist, trying to figure out why people behave the way they do. So um, the important thing actually that I wanna highlight is that growing up, it was not all uh, fantastic, sunny, happy kind of a childhood. Um, and my biggest, concern was to fit into a different sort of a community or population. But actually, um, I had experiences of loss. My father died at an early age. And my mom, uh, who actually remarried, 
yanked me away from grandma, who was actually my primary care provider at the time, uh, as you probably noticed by my conversation about my mom, she yanked me to another province, another place without any warning. So all of a sudden, here goes grandma, and I basically was separated from um, a source of affection and uh, nurturing without any uh, sort of a heads up. And so I, I truly, when I um, watch some of the news or broadcasting about kids at the border who are separated, I mean, I, I even get emotional talking about it. Mm -hmm. It is hard. It is really hard to experience things like this. Yeah. I am 60 years old and I remember a trauma that is six, when I was six years old. Mm. So mm. some of these children are so young and, and they're lost, perhaps not knowing what has happened. No one probably explains to them what is going on. Mm. So when we talk about cultural trauma, when we talk about things that happen because of your place in the society or your immigration status. These things are not simple politics. They impact people and their lives. Yeah. So I apologize for getting emotional, but this is really close to my heart. No, 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 don't apologize. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an authentic story. And um, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I think it's as people hear your story, as I hear your story, there's just aspects that we can relate to and understand, and especially the emotional, emotional load that it, it, it has on our, in our lives. And I think what you're speaking to is that the, the continued impact that it has that, that oftentimes I think we, we don't always, we underestimate sometimes. Underestimate yeah, sometimes. we do underestimate. And as you can see, it can be re-traumatizing. So yeah. six, 60 years later, 40, 50 years later, I, I witnessed kids being pulled away, and that is re-traumatizing. Yeah. yeah. So this is this is really important. I guess the issue of trauma, at the time, it was not life-threatening. It was not a big capital T trauma for me at the time, perhaps, if you want to use the DSM definition of what big T trauma is. But whatever it was, it was distressing enough, and it was important enough to have sort of its ripple effects 50 some years later. And what is really important about that experience that I wanna highlight, which talks about the importance of the screening using it in primary care kind of situations is that I became very sick. Um, I actually, um, my lymph nodes in my throat um, after the separation, we went to a small uh, rural area because my mom's husband, um, my stepdad was actually a, a structural engineer. So they were building a road. So we went to a rural area away from the city, away from grandma, all happening very quickly without any warning. And that separation, I got really, really sick. And I, my lymph nodes began to swollen and it got so bad that I couldn't swallow or drink or something like that. So it became a major medical problem that ended up hospitalizing me. Mm. So no one at the time noticed, no one at the time related what happened to me to possibly a trauma <laughs> that happened practically a month before my illness. So these things are interesting to kind of highlight perhaps from a personal perspective to sort of realize that um, as professionals, especially, I mean, I've been practicing for so long, as professionals, when we hear people's stories, over time, we develop these uh, skills to sort of uh, remain objective, create some distance, and be able to sort of take a perspective that allows us to work with uh, certain clients. But when we're talking about um, this type of traumas that are especially when we are talking about immigration and cultural trauma, when people are put in positions and situations that they are really feeling helpless and they're not able to um, manage or um, perhaps use their strengths in a way to cope with it, um, we are determining or perhaps causing problems and issues that may not just manifest itself emotionally, they may actually manifest themselves medically. And we know now that um, there is certainly a very close connection between 
certain illnesses and stress. But this is uh, also to highlight that when you are experiencing these uh, type of traumas early on, it impacts you over your lifetime. As a person, I've always had the privilege of uh, good nutrition. I was in sports, so I had sort of a, a good lifestyle, good habits. But nevertheless, um, I am my threshold to becoming ill is very, very low. Um, after that one separation that lent me uh, into a hospital, I had my, we go back to grandma. So we return back to grandma. I'm with grandma for a couple of years and I get yanked again. My mom had this sort of a uh, interesting philosophy, which I learned about it later that if you tell children what is going to happen, they become really anxious and distressed. So it's better not to tell them. It's just, they better just experience it. So, um, so that is another lesson perhaps to talk about is that when we are dealing with kids and when we are working with children, it's so important to actually help them understand what is going to happen to them and process it because otherwise it might be a simple thing or a simple thing to us, but it can become a traumatic experience to them. So, with that said, that second separation and being pulled now, going to the capital city, away from grandma, away from everything I knew, um, I actually became sick again. And this was right after the time that my mom actually decided to go through a honeymoon uh, sort of experience. And I mean, I'm not blaming her. She needed to have a honeymoon. She didn't have it when she got married. And so she put me actually in a boarding school during summer. This was, again, without letting me know what was going on. So here I go to school thinking mom is going to pick me up. But that was a boarding school. So I was in the school for about a week, almost 10 days, without knowing as to why my mom is not picking me up. So this was a significant second separation, almost neglect, feeling of experience of neglect. And the kind of the fear of uh, not knowing if your mom is coming back. So, and this was in a capital city. So I was not in the same province that I was raised in. I, people were very unfamiliar to me. The accents were different. And then mom shows up, takes me back home. Within a span of a month, I became very, very sick again. I actually had meningitis, spinal meningitis, ended up in a hospital, had, went into a coma for 48 hours because of the fevers and all of that. So I became very, very sick. And... My mom's thing was, um, I don't know what happens to you. Every time you have something good, <laughs> you get sick. And in her mind, things were happening, were positive, were pleasant. And she was basically having a better life and not being mindful of what was going on with the child that she was caring for and not being mindful of how these separations and these sudden sort of uh, decisions that she was making, perhaps not sudden for her, but sudden for me, were impacting me. Mm -hmm. So that was another kind of a experience I had with a significant sort of trauma experience again uh, for me and having the medical conditions that kind of uh, came about later on. And these two experiences, and there are actually a few more, which I won't want to take your time, but over time, being around people who seemed not to really um, be mindful of uh, little people or children uh, at a time uh, sort of made me wanting to learn more about why people make the decisions that they make. So being raised with my mom's uh, extended family after my mom divorced, which was yet another <laughs> kind of a separation, but after she divorced and we end up living with my mom's family, there was a lot going on. Um, and people were sort of in a way um, themselves having their own issues, not of being the only child, again, in a household of all adults, all having issues, kind of brought me to this place that by 15, all I wanted to become was to become a psychologist. I wanted to know what on earth is going on with people around me and why do they behave the way they do. 
which might be a way to say that I was hoping I can find a way to explain and to make sense out of my experiences um, the best way I could. And that became my career, my passion, my future in a sense. And so as an example, I can basically tell you that a lot of my early experiences and how I was basically dealt with as a child growing up, um, I did not experience any malice, any abuse of any kind, perhaps, but some of the other experiences were, were difficult and were certainly distressing. And the need to know, uh, the need wanting to understand and wanting to help other people understand as to what is happening to them comes from my own early experiences of not knowing what is going on and not understanding what's happening and being overwhelmed by those experiences. So in a sense, I thought that maybe sharing some of this with you and kind of relating how medical health <laughs> is so closely connected to your mental health and understanding that we need to be mindful of children um, in our environment and understand that some things may not seem as a trauma to an adult, but it could be a trauma to a child. And that mindfulness and that um, sensitivity, taking the time to explaining things to children becomes very relevant. And when I work with patients uh, all these years and clients, what I've noticed is that my life story is not one of a kind, perhaps, there are many people who have had similar experiences of losses, separations, feeling overwhelmed, feeling helpless, some chronically uh, to the extent that um, they never had a respite. I had respites from here and there, but people who lived a life that was basically punctuated with different types of traumas um, as adults, they probably need a lot more understanding and support. They probably do not need more discrimination and more marginalization. So I'm hoping that as we do um, this talk and more talks coming up probably, as a community, we begin to become more aware. We become more aware and more sensitive and more uh, responsive to get to know every person for who they are, understand their stories without judgment. And I just want you to just reflect for a few seconds if we have the time about how you heard my story and how you would have heard it differently if it was a patient talking to you um, and how your reactions to my story might have been different than the story of a client. Just reflect on that and that may give you some ideas as to how you are um, perhaps dealing with the issue of um, early childhood uh, experiences, adverse childhood experiences. So Miguel, I'm just going to stop and let you ask me questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Maria. Appreciate it. No, that was really powerful. It, might, it, 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 you know, what came up for me, several things, but I think one of them was just even thinking about, you know, not, not playing with um, the uh, Afghani uh, kids and, and, you know, and, and being told, Stay, and, and then hearing your story about trauma and, and just your experiences, it, it, it reminds me of that. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with the TED Talk by um, Chimamanda Adichie. Um, I, I might be mispronouncing her name, but um, it's called the danger, of, the danger of a Single Story. And it's very powerful. And it just reminds me of just how, how we have to just be mindful about not buying into a single narrative of, of just our experiences of other cultures, other experience, other people, even thinking about the kids at the border. You know, I think a lot of times a reaction is, you know, how could their parents, you know, leave, leave them and send them by themselves and say, you know, well, look, like 90% of those parents, maybe all of them are like, they don't want to send their kids anywhere they don't have to, but they're, they're, the, the, the circumstances in which their lives exist in you know, um, I think um, it's hard. It's hard. We don't want to judge. We don't want to put that judgment and that onus on them because we just don't, we don't always know the full story. And, and I know you've also, I've known you for well over a decade at this point. I know you also have had some other experiences growing up in, in, in Iran that you haven't talked about that were also very cultivating for you in terms of kind of how you 
negotiate and see the world at this moment in time. And then just the re-traumatization that happens uh, too, I think that, you know, that, you know, even just, you know, as you're reflecting on the kids at the border and the, the re-trauma that happens, the re-traumatization that happens. And I, I think that that, that is uh, 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 happening all over the place right now for so many people. Um, and, and so, you know, as we think about the ACEs and the screening and, and, and the, I, I'm also thinking like, we, sometimes the questions that I think are asked of communities, particularly BIPOC communities, underserved communities, uh, we're, we may not always respond to those questions for a lot of different reasons. So, I, and, and, and so I'm wondering, like, as you think about like the, the, the ACEs screening and cultural, you know, and trauma informed considerations we might be thinking about, how, how do we, how do we implement like an ACEs screening to ensure that like, it's culturally and, and culturally embedded in some ways so that we're not missing important questions we might be asking. We're asking the right questions sometimes. We're not re-traumatizing people. What, what, do you, what do you think about that? Like, how do we go about gathering this information about people's yeah. experiences? Well, thank you for that question, Miguel, because um, I actually wanna uh, put a shout out for this uh, uh, website. Um, this is, uh, I, I just, just the name of it just escaped me for a second. It, it's the, the National Child Traumatic um, Stress Network. Mm. The National Child Traumatic Stress Network. It's an amazing website. They have amazing resources for culturally responsive type of um, assessment or care. So I really highly recommend those of you who have not never met or never uh, visited this uh, site, please do, because they have tons of resources that can inform you in a meaningful way. But what is kind of relevant um, and what I would like to share based on my own experience is that um, two things are really important. And actually, you see this in research as well. The ACE number, or focusing very closely on the screening, ACE screening, uh, has its own sort of um, problems. I think. Um, one is that people cannot really be summarized by numbers. That's one thing. Um, it, it sort of, in a sense, it may take away from acknowledging or um, understanding resiliency. So it's really important to sort of not limit uh, our understanding of anyone to a number. But especially when it comes to evaluation of people of different backgrounds and culture. When um, one thing I have noticed is that the mainstream Eurocentric kind of acculturated, um, highly educated, liberal sort of environment, people may not really think twice about assessment. They may actually think that this is a great thing, like, wow, we're getting this information that we can use to help people. But from a different perspective, from the perspective of someone who comes from a different background, who may have experienced assessment or questioning in a very negative environment, maybe from the police or perhaps from people who were trying somehow to cause trouble for this person, any type of format of questioning, doesn't matter if it's in-person questioning or a paper pencil questioning, actually creates anxiety. And people are not quite open to respond to some of these questions, especially when there are private uh, information about their, early their, their childhood experiences. And many people want to forget about them. That's their way of coping. So, by reporting them, they feel like they're opening a can of worms. So they don't want to even acknowledge that they have these experiences. So these assessments should really be taken with a grain of salt as, as all assessments and be sort of a way of maybe starting a conversation, starting a kind of a exploration in a sense. And we know that it has impact that some people actually respond very positively to it. That's one find is know what has happened to them. But in the long run, understanding the culture and the background and how you need to go about asking these questions with a great deal of sensitivity and perhaps before anything else, making sure that the person who is being um, 
is participating in this process understand what this is for. Because sometimes we don't really explain things and we think people get it. But we learned in our work with especially new immigrants that they really do not respond well to paper pencil measures mm -hmm. um, unless they have a relationship with the therapist. So after they kind of know uh, the organization, they know the case manager, they know the therapist, they receive some services so that they know we're coming from a good place and we want to help them. Then you see they actually report a lot more problems or traumas or experiences that they've had um, that before when we were asking them, they were not open to discuss it. Mm -hmm. So I think that awareness is important. And also um, in a sense, kind of knowing the language is very, very important. Um, trying to use a translator often is not very effective, um, especially about, again, information that people may perceive as private. Uh, it would be important to have case managers or um, therapists who speak the language uh, to be able to ask those questions in a way that is sort of um, less intrusive or uh, people may feel less um, anxious responding to those questions with the presence of an interpreter. So that is something we've noticed with the people we're working with. Um, and it's important for people to sort of keep in mind that assessments are not always welcomed or understood yeah. uh, the same way we do understand them by other communities, other backgrounds. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm, I'm noticing our time. I know we have a whole lot of time left, but I, I want to ask just, you know, what, what are your recommendations for um, and, and thoughts about like how, how we do this better, you know, moving forward or what, what are some other things we can do to, to develop really a, um, uh, to address, you know, community trauma, childhood trauma, and, and really through an informed sort of network of care that that really, you know, makes sense for the, the the diversity of experiences that people are coming to to seek some some healing from in some ways. Yeah, um, I guess I want to kind of um, bring your attention to how I shared my information in in the sense that I believe our professional community, especially, need to become more um, introspective mm -hmm. <laughs> and more sensitive and sort of in a way become more aware of their own humanity, their own experiences, their own traumas mm. and how they've managed it. And sort of understand that not everybody is able to do that. <laughs> not everybody has the same resources or the same strengths or resiliency. But more importantly, I think by understanding ourselves and becoming aware of our own vulnerabilities and how we have, um, managed or how we have been avoiding some of those vulnerabilities, it helps us as professionals to be more, um, uh, to be more responsive, to not um, rush towards labeling, not to rush towards um, perhaps pathologizing social problems, because that is something that, that's one of my pet peeves that I've had problems with is that a lot of times we are pathologizing and labeling uh, with medical diagnoses issues and uh, experiences that are really uh, a normal reaction to mm -hmm. social injustice, yes. to power differentials, to discrimination. And, and that I believe is the biggest and the probably biggest obstacle or barrier in our way to um, create culturally informed, responsive, um, trauma-informed care is for us to not be aware of how social um, ills um, impact people's lives and who they are and what they become and how they behave and just put everything into a sort of a individualized medical model of brain behavior, brain and sort of uh, brain reactions and things like that. It's really important to pay more attention to the social aspect of our experience and how we deal with it. I actually came across this book. I wanted to put a shout out for it. It's called Measuring the Effects of Racism by Carter and Pietras. And it's an awesome book that talks about 
stress of racism and discrimination and how that impacts people's mental health mm -hmm. and how you see actually on PTSD reaction to some of these experiences. So we have a clinical medical label for it, but it's important to recognize and acknowledge um, the social determinants of many of these uh, trauma reactions. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I want to make just one quick comment that just in follow up, I'm going to turn back over to Ileana, but I, you know, I, I said this, Ileana have done, have, and I have done a couple of, of presentations recently. And, and every time I, I say this and your comment reminded me of this, it's like, maybe it's the systems that are not well and not our peoples, right? Not our yes. people. And so I think it's a way of reframing the, I think our, 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 the lens through which we understand and, and begin to try to help people heal in some way. So what are the challenges people are experiencing and what are their, what are their beliefs about what it means to restore healing and health and wellness? And I think that's, that's very different than how we sometimes come at it in some ways. So I, I really appreciate that, Maria. Um, really appreciate you sharing as well. Very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Ileana, Thank you so much. Back over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, lift up uh, some of the comments that we've heard in the chat um, from Suri. Uh, it says, yes, Dr. Siati, medicine and other systems and structures pathologize folks who lack capital, social, economic, cultural, et cetera, rather than empowering them. So, Miriam, thank you for sharing your story. Um, I, I've known you for quite a while too, and I, I appreciate learning more about you. And um, you have great recommendations, resources, and insights. And I think I'm gonna quote you on, people cannot be summarized by a number. You know, we really need to hear their story. So I, I deeply appreciate your approach. Um, you know, we've been uh, through this year long pandemic and hopefully we're recovering from it. Um, what are your thoughts on how we can collectively um, heal? You know, what are some community and cultural healing practices that we should consider moving forward? Part of the uh, screen after the screening and treatment of um, ACEs is, is the healing part. You know, how do we do that in a culturally informed way? Well, um, what I've learned. Uh, at my age is that healing is not a, um, it's a process mm -hmm. and it's very individualized. In other words, every person heals in a different way or um, in a different time frame. So we cannot rush it. We cannot rush healing. And some people actually during this COVID have lost everything everything that they had, they've lost uh, not only a financial, they, they did not just lose a job or financial security, they have lost their place of residence. They have um, sort of experienced all kinds of um, fear uh, of getting ill or some people have lost significant people in their lives. So some of the losses have been really, really serious and significant and for us to hope that people heal quickly is, is, is really not fair, I would say. I think people need time to heal. And what really helps, I believe, is um, we can never replace uh, people, the loved ones that we've lost, but for people who are now experiencing significant um, economic uh, distress, the best would be to actually help them to help communities is to make sure that people who have lost practically everything are going to get their feet back on the ground and find the path towards recovering, towards um, having sort of an opportunity or having some help and support to have safer and more secure lives. The, the experience of not knowing what's going to happen to you or to your family, that economic sort of uh, instability and lack of resources will be a major barrier uh, in the healing process. Unless people get their first basic needs met, um, the psychological healing cannot really begin. We need to first meet the basic needs, making sure people are safe and secure and financially secure or they were before, and then they, they will have opportunities for psychological healing. Meanwhile, 
we can just provide them mental health support to be there at least so that our communities don't feel that they are in this struggle all by themselves, that they hear there are people who are willing to hear them, that there are people here to help them get connected to resources. So the Cal Hope program that we are doing um, in, in response to um, this situation, I think can be very, very helpful is to make sure people know about Cal Hope um, and it's the program to um, provide sort of a crisis management to anyone who needs it and calls the warm lines. And I don't have the number with me here. So anyone who calls um, for help and support will be helped and supported. I think that is the minimal, um, minimum thing that we can do for our communities. Thank you, Miriam. Um, I put the links to our website, which um, will connect you to the uh, Hope for Orange County uh, program, which is offered in 15 languages and by over 12 organizations. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, I think it's definitely a needed resource right now. And um, I wanted to, um, there's a question in the chat and also a comment. Uh, Jennifer Jordan says, and sure, she agrees with you and, and we need to ensure that we are being sensitive and validating to everyone's experiences and continue to be educated on trauma-informed philosophy, exercise empathy and active listening. And then there's a final question for all of you from one of our participants. Um, Sri says, unfortunately medicine and healthcare like most other systems are still hierarchical and power tends to flow top down with folks like us providers having power over whom we serve. What does a more power with structure look like for you when we share our power in a more equitable manner? Wow, interesting question. How do we share? Yeah, that's, a, that's a big question. I wonder if Miguel wants to chime in on this one. <laughs> uh, how, did I, how did I know you might do that actually? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, that's the $64,000 question in some ways. Look, I think, I, I don't know the, you know, um, that there's a one size universal fits all approach to what that will look like. Because I think the context matters and the, you know, the, the, the circumstances. But I would say that one thing we have to do, you know, going back to what I said earlier in, in response to some of the things that, that Miriam talked about, look, when we, when we put the onus on the individual as being, or the family or the child as being the sole bearer of responsibility for the challenges that they are experiencing. And, and I, I sort of try to even move away from calling people patients and clients. And you know, I, I think even the language we use is also part of the, the, the maintenance of power and the maintenance of privilege in, in, in sort of our roles and, and, and what we, how we see things. I think we have to deconstruct and decolonize our work and our, and, our, and our interventions, our theories, our practices. It's not just even about culturally adapting, it's about culturally indigenizing practices from the bottom up, from the ground up, from communities who, who are well-informed about what they need to heal themselves oftentimes. And so I think when we, when we continue to, to reinforce that the individual is the sole bearer of responsibility for, for what they're experiencing, we are reinforcing society's mental health status quo, mental wellness status quo. And so I think we need to stop trying to fit people into places that they don't fit into. And then when they don't fit into those places, we start to chip away at who they are, their identities, their, their experiences, you know, what they, their culture, their language to mold and fit into the systems that were not created or made for them and for us oftentimes. And so many of our treatment methods and, and whatnot have not been, um, you know, um, they were not normed and validated in, 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 in research terms, you know, for many of the communities that they're trying to, you know, imp be implemented with. And so I think it's around even just beginning to, to respectfully begin to critique and question who does this work for, for whom, under what circumstances and why? And, and, and who benefits from the continued implementation of this, of this work these, within the systems? You know, who's benefiting, who's not benefiting? I think sometimes we're not the folks that we're, you know, I, I, I love what Miriam said earlier around, I was thinking about like, you know, the personal is political and the political is personal. 
And I'm, when I'm talking about political, I'm talking about the wholeness and wellness of who we are as individuals. You know, we can't leave that at the door because, you know, we, we bring in our whole selves in, in who we are. And so those two things, there needs, there needs to be some synchronicity in that work to humanize and to de deconstruct and decolonize the systems that we're in. It's a lot easier said than done, but I think we have to first start asking questions and thinking about it a little bit differently. I just love that, Miguel. Thank you for that insight. Um, you know, I think we sometimes just do things automatically and we need to question it. And we all, we, we need to ensure that the systems that we're creating or we, you know, are responsive to the communities that we serve and it works for them. So as we build this network of care, I think your insights, um, you know, I, they'll, they'll be shared with the broader network. You guys are both amazing. Um, we have a few minutes left. Any final thoughts, uh, Dr. Sietti? Final recommendations? Um, yeah, actually, I want to just quickly share this with you. When I was younger, um, I was quite a revolutionary. So I even participated in, in a part of the beginning of the Iran revolution. And that's why I was shipped to United States as an as a, on exile. But I felt like things have to change in a big from the sort of a bit of revolution. What I've learned over the years, and now that I'm older and wiser, I'm not 16 anymore, um, I'm learning that each one of us can actually change um, our own behavior, our own way of doing things, and model for everybody else, in a sense. So the change transformation really starts with each of us. If we are waiting for the big system to change from the top, it's not going to change. It will resist change, actually. And change and transformation is really hard work, but it starts with us. However we go about it, how, how much we inform people and how much we practice what we preach is going to eventually change the system and transform it from the bottom up, from the inside out. So that is really what I have learned in life, that revolutions necessarily don't change much. <laughs> it is the personal quest for transformation and change that might actually help to bring about the change that we are hoping for. Thank you so much, Miriam. And um, just a couple of last plugs. I, if Please support the wonderful work that Miriam Sayeti does. You can go to omidinstitute.org and make a contribution to, <laughs> to um, as well as go to Dr. Gallardo. Um, dot com and follow his cultural humility podcast um, there's a lot of great topics that he covers uh, do you want to say anything about that Miguel one, one final no, moment no no thank you though thanks for making the announcement <laughs> about it but thank all good thank you <laughs> um, feel free to follow us at ocmethod.org and some of our other um, uh, handles that I put on the chat. Thank you everyone for participating today and thank you for participating in the survey and the polls. And uh, this is our last um, conversation and the next step to this is we'll be creating a brown paper. Everyone that um, participated in our conversations will get an email notification uh, when we uh, put that together. And um, I lead the equity and inclusion group uh, for the Orange County Trauma-Informed Network of Care. If you're interested in participating in that, please email me at um, iliana at ocmecca.org, I-L-I-A-N-A -A at ocmecca.org. Thank you all for participating today. Thank you, Dr. Sietti. Thank you. <laughs>